Good Gut Live. We are speaking all on the topic of SIBO and IBS. We are going to be answering questions live and we are here to just connect with you on a 100% plant-based approach to SIBO and IBS. And we will clarify that in more depth. Okay. So we're very excited today. We've done many Good Gut Lives for those who've been following along on our YouTube, across Facebook, wherever you're watching this. We are also on Instagram Live, which is very fun to do. And uh, yeah, we're going to be, we have some questions from our Good Gut members mm -hmm. who've already put in some questions. So we have some really great questions there. Again, we're going to be of answering you asked us questions on Instagram. Yeah. On Instagram, we have some of your questions and we're also going to be looking at questions coming in live through Instagram, as well as through Facebook or YouTube. If you're watching this live, if you're watching this later, you can still comment down below. Let us know what you want to learn about, or if you have questions on what we mentioned, um, for those of you that maybe don't know us, my name is James Marin. I'm an integrative registered dietitian, environmental nutritionist. I'm Dahlia Marin. I'm also an integrative registered dietitian, licensed dietitian, and gut health expert. So super excited to talk about this topic because I'm so, so passionate about SIBO IBS. It's what I do day in, day out. I talk to my patients about SIBO and IBS all day long. So I love coming here and kind of just answering some questions. I'm really excited to get into some of these because I think they're really pertinent for what a lot of you have going on. And maybe you are one of those people who's been given that diagnosis of IBS. You know, studies estimate mm -hmm. that anywhere between 5 and 15% of Americans suffer with IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, which is a disorder of the gut-brain connection. And studies also show that 14 to 70, 70% 70 of mm -hmm. those with IBS also likely have SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So since we know so many of you are walking around with this, we want to be here to support you because we yes. know that you have questions. I would say especially those who are trying to go at it with plant-based nutrition because you are under-resourced and we've recognized that. We've been dietitians for 10 years. We've been plant-based ourselves for 12. So we have mm -hmm. really heard that those in the plant-based community or those who are predominantly plant-based have been told that fiber is the opposite of what they should be eating, especially while they're dealing with this. So we're here to give you all, yeah. all the gold. And then with Married to Health, that is our private practice. We have multiple other registered dietitians who can serve you. So we're really excited about that. So we're excited. Um, and yeah, and just talking about under-resourced, I mean, in the plant-based community, if you have gut issues, SIBO, IBS, you're told, hey, you can't be plant-based anymore. So we are here to tell you otherwise, and we're here to back it up with research and with years and years of experience doing this. So we're mm -hmm. all about, you know, again, our tagline, heal with each meal, feel with each meal. And we're also help you to just revitalize with plants, uh, really connect with the essential carbohydrate, which, which is fiber. We do not make fiber in our body. We have to get it from the environment. So fiber is essential for our health and our gut health. So anyone telling you otherwise, I mean, again, context matters. Mm -hmm. If you're having gut issues, maybe you don't want to have 100 or 120 grams of fiber a day. That's probably not going to feel good, right? Uh, so, so there is context there, but that doesn't mean get rid of all the fiber. So I say, let's, are you ready to dive right into some questions? We'll maybe start there. Mm -hmm. And a quicker overview, I mean, SIBO, just for those who don't know, stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. IBS is irritable bowel syndrome. SIBO can also be uh, it can also be CFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth, IMO, intestinal methanogenic overgrowth. So it's basically an overgrowth of a microbe in your small intestine, right? And because we, we don't, we want most of our microbes to be in the large intestine. We don't want the microbes to be flourishing fully and being saturated in the small intestine. So there's a big difference there. When that happens, that can cause a lot of issues with digestion, absorption, bloating, gas, stinky smelling gas. It can cause uh, autoimmune issues, reflux, constipation. I mean, you name it. And this is where we have to say, for those of you that don't know, we are big believers in really the gut microbiome specifically, but also the human microbiome, meaning all the microbes and their DNA and even viruses and fungi and archaea and all these guys 
are the epicenter of all health on the planet. Your inner ecosystem is the most important ecosystem on this planet. If we all care for our inner ecosystem, we care for all ecosystems on the planet. So we are big, big believers in that. And we're happy to answer any questions on that because I know that could be like, mm. what are you talking about kind of, but uh, but we'll get into a little bit more. So, And we've done other lives on this. So if you are on Instagram, you can yeah. go back, check our feed. If you want, you can go to our YouTube and just hear us talk about what is SIBO, um, root causes of SIBO, how to move past SIBO. So if you're feeling like you need to fill in the gaps and you're like, hmm, they mentioned something, but I don't know much about it, go to our YouTube and you can search all these topics because we've been doing these good gut lives for quite some time. So there are lots and lots of videos that you can go back and watch and just learn more details if you feel like anything here was missed out on. But you guys had questions and we told you we'd answer them. So So we our, want to. <laughs> our good gut members had some questions. So these they get they get first dibs because they're our good gut members. Yes. Um, but um yeah, so let's where do you want to start, Dahlia? I'll kind of let you pick. You have the questions right there. So someone is asking, my main question at the moment is whether or not it's really possible to rid yourself of SIBO symptoms such as bloating long term and be able to eat all the good foods too. I know the answer should be yes, but I feel a little stuck. Ugh, yes. This is frustrating, right? Because it takes a lot to get someone to a SIBO diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Usually with SIBO, it's a collection of these symptoms. It's excessive gas, bloating. It can be diarrhea, constipation, alternating diarrhea, constipation. And if somebody has tested positive for SIBO, it's either because they have dysbiosis or significant imbalance of the inflammatory versus the anti-inflammatory microbes in their gut. They might have dysmotility. So something's off with the way that their gut is moving and flowing and kind of keeping these microbes balanced in the gut, or they might have a lot of permeability or leaky gut, right? A lot of people talk about leaky gut nowadays. So really it's about the barrier. It's about the movement and it's about the balance. And sometimes when people come to me, they will say, I have had these gut issues since I was six years old (laughs) and maybe they're 46 at this point. So if you've been living something with something for months or years or decades, hopefully it won't take you nearly that long to figure it out, especially with you when you're with a knowledgeable care team, but it might not be a very quick solution. So it might take a year. It might Mm -hmm. take investigative work. If you have not yet really nailed down one of the root causes, until you really identify it, it's going to be hard to get over the symptoms. The symptoms are your body's messengers so they can say, hey, something's wrong and maybe you haven't figured it out yet. Maybe you've tried different restrictive diets or supplements or antibiotics and they're not doing it yet. Um, So maybe there's a little bit more investigating to do. I will say... Um, one of the most underrated root causes that's often not yet discovered for people is pelvic floor issues, especially what is the pelvic floor? So the pelvic floor is this collection of muscles that either move or surround and support our rectum, our colon, which is our large intestine, our bladder, our reproductive organs, and more. They're really holding everything up in the pelvis and, you know, they help support the rest of the organs higher up. Your organs aren't just a bowl of soup in your body, like sloshing (laughs) around or hopefully not. Maybe (laughs) some of you might have a a soup scenario going on. Hopefully not. But yeah, you do have this mesentery, you do have the pelvic floor, you do have this, these muscles and things Mm -hmm. are, are held intact in a really special way. Um, Yeah. So I, I do tend to find those who have this persistent bloating, no matter if they eat low fiber high fiber, plant-based, not plant-based. Again, they've maybe tried different SIBO antibiotics with their care team or antimicrobials. They've tried probiotics and not, and their bloat just, it's still there. Sometimes Mm -hmm. it maybe gets a little better when they're less stressed, but it's still there. I will say a large percentage of that time, they have pelvic floor issues. So maybe some of the muscles are hypertonic too constricted and too strong Mm -hmm. where maybe they're not fully relaxing to let you fully empty your bowels. Maybe those rectal muscles or the muscles in the end of the colon are just too used to tightening up. Maybe for years you held in gas or diarrhea. So those muscles just got overworked or maybe that happened during pregnancy where they got overworked. 
And now when you go to have a bowel movement, it doesn't feel complete because those muscles will allow some stool to release and then they'll kind of clamp back up, tense back up. Maybe someone has a hypotonic, a low toned pelvic floor where those muscles are a little too weak and things aren't moving the way that they need to. Maybe somebody has a prolapse where those muscles have maybe collapsed or they need a little bit of repair and maybe their bladder is sinking down through those muscles where it's not supposed to or their rectum or another organ. So I will say if pelvic floor issues haven't been ruled out and you haven't worked on your pelvic floor muscles with a specially trained pelvic floor physical therapist, it's always worth the time. I want to really focus on this question uh, and you can add or we can keep going, but because yeah. this, this, we can keep going just on this one question, but the idea of feeling stuck with yes. gut issues. So when you, when you are feeling stuck with gut issues, understand this, it is, it is really because there can be a host of roots leading to the gut issues. So really, um, this is true with, with one of my specialties and what I really love, which is environmental aspects, what we call the exposome in relation to the gut microbiome. There can be a lot of factors coming into your life and your body that are influencing your chronic conditions or your symptoms. So really feeling stuck can be maybe you haven't addressed each one of your factors. So if maybe, maybe you have five things that are contributing to your gut issues and you've only addressed two, you're like, man, I've done all this work. Mm. I, I, my nutrition, right? My nutrition, I've done all this work. I went gluten-free, dairy-free, I'm plant-based. I'm SOS. I'm, you know, all the other acronyms in the nutrition space. And oh my God, and my fitness, I work out every day and I do that. But like Dahlia said, there's pelvic floor. Maybe you were exposed to mold. Maybe you have emotional trauma stress, and stress, stress, right? Mm -hmm. Your your job, family. And so you've only hit two out of the five. You can feel stuck. There's more than those. And there's more. There's like 20, right? I mean, not to overwhelm you. But so so if you've only hit two and you've done a lot of work, which is excellent, Mm -hmm. you might feel stuck because you're in limbo between these factors. And you're without addressing kind of more of them, you do feel stuck and you may go back and forth, back back and forth with the symptoms. Overall, you may be making progress, but maybe it's... Sometimes you can degress because I've had this happen where people are really putting all their proverbial eggs in that nutrition basket and they're like, oh, it's not solving all my problems, but I really want it to. So let me just restrict more and more and more. And then they start having an unhealthy relationship with food. Or if they really want food to be the only answer, every meal becomes a stressful event. And if stress is maybe one of the biggest root cause factors for you, Mm. and food then becomes another source of stress, this can exacerbate everything even more. And maybe you've held on to that food trauma since you were little, right? Clean your plate. Eat this food. Maybe you were restrictively eating growing up because you didn't have control. So that Mm. can be so, so, so important to delve into as well. Okay. I see great questions coming in. We still have more questions. Let's let's continue. Or, okay, wondering why some SIBO diets restrict so much at the start and why why you advise against that, um, e.g. biphasic diet, even if the end goal is to reach plant diversity. Great question. Mm-hmm. So essentially, why do some plans like the biphasic diet, there's other like SIBO programs out there and things. It's like very restrictive at first. So why is that? Mm-hmm. So I think that can be for a few different reasons. And not everyone does this. So you might mm-hmm. hear some SIBO practitioners out there saying, you should do a little bit of restriction to start with. Others will say, do not do any restriction to start with. Mm-hmm. And there's you know, different schools of thought. So those who say don't restrict at all before you treat SIBO, because SIBO is not always treated, usually is never treated with diet alone. You need some type of antimicrobial antibiotic. Um, Some will say, if you aren't eating those foods, those microbes will go into hiding. And then you take the treatment. Maybe it doesn't 100% wipe out what it could. So some actually will say, eat all the FODMAPs and eat all the histamines or eat the things that you're reacting to. So that way they're there, they're present, they're fed, and then we'll kind of try to balance things off. Others will say, hey, let's ease into this. Let's start 
kind of at a, a more restricted place or just a less diverse place. And then let's build on that. And that mm-hmm. can be for a couple reasons. So again, I've heard some of these practitioners say that they feel that if you restrict at first, it can reduce the amount of die off you'll experience because they feel that if you restrict at first, you'll kill off some of the bacteria because it just starves. Um, that's not yet confirmed, but that's, I think where some people are coming from. So they'll feel like if they kind of die off themselves, when you're taking treatment for them, you'll have less of a die off reaction. So I think that's one of the reasons why they do this. Um, Others will also say restrict. And, you know, we, even in our practice, we'll say, let's use a reverse elimination. And the reason that we do this is because When you have SIBO, think of it as you had a really significant injury when you were exercising. Maybe you like tore your rotator cuff. Let's give that example. So if you do have a significant injury like that, you kind of want to take it easy and you want to give that shoulder rest rather than keeping on being like, no, I'm just going to keep lifting. I'm going to keep doing stuff. Power through. Right? So you you want to give it some rest so it can have attention to rest and heal. That might be necessary as well. If your gut is constantly digesting very complex foods, it doesn't have as much energy to pull into healing itself. So that could be one motivation for some. Um, The other reason is often with SIBO, again, just like if you have damage with an injury, if you do have SIBO, in fact, they can damage the lining of the small intestine Mm -hmm. and what's called microvilli, which help you absorb nutrients from your food in your small intestine. And so you want to give them a chance again to heal, to repair themselves. So your gut can become less permeable, less leaky. Um, So that can happen in that time when you are kind of working yourself up and it's really in the lining of your small intestine and the brush border, you're making some of the, some of these digestive enzymes. So you're building back capacity and affinity to properly digest and absorb your food. So I think, so to summarize that quick answer would be, this is where it's, it's very individualized and where even uh, overall, I would say it can be helpful to go down certain paths on your SIBO journey. Like even with Dahlia's protocol and program that we use in our practice, there are people going down certain paths, whether it's a lower histamine Mm -hmm. and various paths. So it, it can be even within the realm of reintroduction or elimination or, or holding off on certain foods, it can be very individualized with the end goal of adding as much diversification as possible when it comes to your diet. You're rehabbing that injury. So again, when you were injured and you took a rest, maybe you deconditioned your body a little bit. Mm-hmm. So you're not going to go back to that full lifting capacity that you're at. You're going to start low and slow and build yourself back up. So we take that approach with the gut as well. And we do reverse elimination. And most importantly, assessing how did you get injured in the first Mm. place? And let's not do that again and make sure you're doing things properly. So that is avoided. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Another question. So these were both really great questions. Really great questions. Um, We have another one. What is your opinion on sodium butyrate in terms of rebuilding the microbiome? So butyrate is a postbiotic. We think of it, if you guys have heard our analogy of, because, you know, you hear pre, uh, pro, post, and now it's synbiotic. So there's lots of different terms out there. But, um, you know, with, so think of pre as like the mulch and the compost. Think of probiotics as the plant or seed itself. And think of postbiotics as the fruit. And a symbiotic, is it beautifully working all together? That's that's the analogy, right? So you do, you need the healthy soil and you need the plant to get the fruit, which is the postbiotic. So we make these fruits in our gut, right? We make these fruits and veggies, the things we want from plants in our gut. They're called postbiotics. Our microbes make these beautiful gifts for us. Uh, one being butyrate, which is a short chain fatty acid. We also make proteins. We make B12. We can make omega threes. We can make so many cool things in the gut. So, uh, and those are all postbiotics. So, with that, yeah, I mean, you could take butyrate. I mean, uh, it's not ideal. It's not. I don't. I don't think no good really, evidence behind it. Yeah, there's not like okay, let me just down a bunch of butyrate. Again, it's it's really asking the. It's like. 
again, go back to the analogy. I grow oranges, but none of my orange trees are actually growing oranges. Let me just buy oranges and staple them onto my tree. Or, or you know, I'm, I have an orange farm and I'm not growing oranges. I'm going to go buy oranges from Costco. Are you really an orange farmer then? So it's assessing why aren't you making enough butyrate? What's going on in your own ecosystem, your own farm? And don't just go out and buy the oranges. Figure out what's going on with your orange trees and help your orange trees to start growing the oranges. Let me know if that makes sense down below. Hopefully that analogy made sense. But yeah. that's that's kind of the idea. And, you know, like I was saying, I don't think we know enough yet about butyrate supplementation because if our microbes in our colon are making butyrate, we don't know then if you're taking butyrate from the top, if it's even going to make it into your colon because it has to still go through your stomach acid. It has to go through your small intestine, be broken down, tried to be digested and absorbed. Mm -hmm. I've heard people say like, oh, I eat, I eat a lot of butter because butter contains butyrate. Um, it's this short chain fatty acid. We don't know if that gets broken down. It's kind of like when people say, oh, I take a ton of collagen because it's going to help me build my collagen. Again, especially someone with gut issues, if you're not even digesting and absorbing food properly, you probably aren't digesting and absorbing these extra supplements properly. And that's not necessarily how it works in the body. You need other constituents to produce collagen. You need other components to produce the short chain fatty acids as well. So uh, we're all about the root cause. And just like Jane said, figure out why you are not producing these short chain fatty acids and work on that. So if you're seeing a lot of mucus in your stool, maybe your stool falls apart very easily. It doesn't stay formed until you flush it or it wipes very messy like peanut butter. Now, those are indicators that you probably have a lot of inflammation in the colon. And that inflammation is probably affecting your affinity, your capacity to produce your own butyrate. So start there. Work on that inflammation. All right. Okay. All right. Next question. Post-infectious IBS and the immune system. I found that I have more issues with upper respiratory infections. I got COVID, flu, and strep this winter. I would like to understand the connection between IBS and the immune system. What can be done to support the gut and immune system at the same time? This could be the whole live. Um, and this, someone's just asked this. Um, can you help me with repairing my gut after traveling to Mexico? So oh, I'm guessing nice. that person might have also gotten traveler's diarrhea or also post-infectious IBS. Yeah. Um, wow. So this is tricky. Um <laughs> Post-infectious gastroenteritis can be tricky to deal with because some of these inflammatory gut bugs that people pick up, whether it's from food or... Oh, dude, I have a story too. <laughs> James has his own. We said this on a live. We, did, um, we were in Mexico in Cabo and I, I, we were at like a resort with some friends. We weren't staying at the resort, um, but we were there with them and they were doing snorkeling and they're like, hey, let's go snorkeling. And the snorkeling rental equipment was already super sketch. Even Dolly was like, I'm not putting my mouth on that snorkel. I'm like, I'm sure they wash it. No, we literally saw people give it back and they're like, here you go to the next person. Yeah, we we're like, oh, okay, maybe they didn't wash it. So that was one. And then two, there's, I mean, tons of fish. It was beautiful. It was fun. It was a great time. But somewhere along that line, I might have swallowed some of the fishy salt water or someone with that snorkel you know, I don't want to think about it too much. And it was after that, I started not feeling well in my stomach. So something happened. It didn't happen to Dahlia. We pretty much ate the same thing, did the same thing, except the snorkel and the snorkeling. Uh, she was very careful with not swallowing water. I kept my mouth shut. <laughs> I was not. And I did the snorkel. So we're, we're deducing it came from that. And I did not have a good time, but I, I bounced back and I recovered and I, I feel fine. I don't have post-infectious IBS, right? Um, why do others, why does it linger for others, right? Um, and there's tons of reasons why you could have already had underlying issues. There's many type of microbes that can hide in your crypts and can linger and stay longer. Um, <laughs> the story, we're seeing comments, this story is amazing. Yeah, it wasn't amazing at the time, <laughs> uh, but I, I did enjoy snorkeling, but I didn't enjoy the aftermath. It was literally when we we're going home, <laughs> thankfully, it was like our last day and I had a ride on the plane like that. Like I was just like, oh man, it, it was not fun. 
but um nevertheless <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but yeah and guys and we're seeing like if yeah if you have a bad connection if you're losing us at the live this will be posted fully on our youtube so you can catch this on our youtube in, in full and we'll so, post yeah. it on instagram too but it can be tricky so james bounced back anyway yeah but there have been many 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 patients who don't bounce back properly. So mm -hmm. um, there is a percentage of people who end up being diagnosed within three to six months of having this post-infectious gastroenteritis. Um, so we do know it can have long-term effects. And what happens is these inflammatory gut bacteria, whether it was salmonella, E. coli, Klebsiella, Citrobacter, whatever type of bacteria mm -hmm. it was that you had, an inflammatory opportunistic type of bacteria, even once they die off, um, they release a toxin called CDTB. And this toxin that these bacteria release can actually bind to what's called vinculin protein in your gut. So in your small intestine, you have something called your migrating motor complex. And this is quite mm -hmm. literally what helps to move things through your top half of your GI tract from your esophagus to the end of your small intestine. So these vinculin um, basically are what plug in these little cells and these nerves in the small intestine. So again, these bacteria release a toxin that binds to vinculin, basically unplugging your nerves that turn on your motility. Mm. And there's actually a test for this. It's pretty cool. It's called the IBS smart test. It's a blood test that your provider can order for you. So they can actually see do you have elevated CDTB toxin in your blood? Do you have elevated antivinculin in your blood? Um, so they can test, is it post-infectious gastroenteritis? Um, but even if it is, you might find that, yeah, these opportunistic bacteria, they rally. They'll rally and they'll kind of call out to other opportunists, like opportunists usually do. They'll be like, hey, guys, there's free food. There's free stuff here. Come on. <laughs> Join me. I have a perfect example of this too. California recently experienced lots of flooding, right? What happens in flooding? Lots of garbage goes everywhere. There's a lot more water. And we tend to get in this moisture more animals that love moisture, right? So if let's say uh, your house gets flooded, let's say the garbage dump gets flooded and there's garbage all over the streets, what are we going to see more of that are opportunists, right? We're going to see more rodents. We're going to see other animals who like moisture, right? And we're going to see them come and they can do even more damage in that op uh, being the opportunist they are. That doesn't mean kill all the rodents, kill all the birds, kill all these opportunist raccoons and and other you know foxes and things like that. It's more to the effect of hey, no, something went wrong in the infrastructure, and therefore it caused this problem to occur. Think of your gut like that. Something went wrong in your gut infrastructure. Maybe it's been building for years or decades. And boom, this this was the flood. This trip to Mexico or Bali or China or wherever was that flood breaking barrier that then opens literally the floodgates for these opportunists to come in and wreak even more havoc, right? On something that was already weak to begin with. So that could be in short answer what's happening. And what can happen from there? Because this person is asking, why am I suddenly now having all these upper respiratory mm. infections? I got the flu and then I got RSV and I keep getting colds and my lungs feel weaker. So mm -hmm. if you have these long lasting effects from these opportunists, these inflammatory microbes, they might be imbalancing things. And not mm -hmm. only in your gut, but our gut microbiome is kind of the epicenter and it communicates with your other microbiomes throughout your body. So you have a lung microbiome, you have a vaginal microbiome, you have a skin microbiome, you have a nasal microbiome. So it could be communicating this more inflammatory state to your lung microbiome as well. And mm -hmm. now you have more inflammatory microbes there. And then your immune system is putting out more inflammatory chemicals like histamines and tryptase and uh, these other uh, cytokines and other immune <laughs> inflammatory chemicals. But yeah. what can you do from here? Because if it is happening, you do want to know where to go from here. So if you're finding that you are susceptible, one, like I said, you can ask your care team if you're finding motility is really affected. And oh, I've never been the same since getting bolly belly, like some of my patients say, mm. or like, you know, traveling to Mexico, wherever it is. Um, maybe ask your care team to test you. Ask, do you guys offer the IBS smart test? 
Um, we know that that's something that we like recommending for our patients. And maybe you need to work on motility. So um, maybe there are some pro-motility agents that can be helpful for you. But if you don't have affected motility and you have just affected immunity, you do want to, one, feed the good gut bugs with prebiotics. So add back in as much fiber as you can tolerate. If you need to go low fiber, still keep in some fiber. Don't go no fiber. Eat probiotic foods. So there was that great study we've referred to many times from Stanford. It showed four to six mm -hmm. servings of probiotic foods per day help to balance anti-inflammatory and inflammatory microbes in the gut and also support the immune system. Um, so that can be helpful. You should also be mindful to replenish things like vitamin D, omega-3, vitamin C, which is also essential. You cannot make it on your own. You need to eat vitamin C and zinc. Um, vitamin D, omega-3, and zinc are essential to the lining of your intestines and then the balance in your body. They're anti-inflammatory as well. So make sure those aren't low for you. Get in more of those foods or if you need to supplement, supplement. Um, hydrate, move, and decrease stress because stress is also inflammatory. And we yes. had someone comment, speaking of stress as well, um, our friend, Dr. Sumit Ball said he also experienced, had terrible IBS for most of my life throughout mid-residency. Years mm. of meditation took care of it. Wish I knew these dietary modifications back then. Thanks for sharing all this info. So yes, again, using these different layers and these different techniques to try to manage things can be so important. Wow. Okay. Does SIBO show up on a GI map? And for those that aren't familiar with the GI map, it is a, basically a testing stool test, stool test uh, to map your stool microbiome, so to speak. There's many factors with that. The short answer is no, <laughs> uh, no. And so we can get into that, but that we've done a live on, on testing for SIBO. So go back on our YouTube. This will be up on our YouTube as well. Quick answer. But quick answer. The no. only two ways you should be testing for SIBO breath test, whether that's in an office at home or ask your gastroenterologist to take a sample of your fluid from your small intestine, small bowel aspirate, test that. That's but fun. that's really the only two ways you should be diagnosing. If a practitioner has told you you have SIBO based on a stool test, you are not working with a SIBO knowledgeable practitioner. So that is not an appropriate way to test for SIBO. And even with stool testing, you know, it's not a hundred percent solid yet. We don't know enough about stool no tests. Pint. They're not validated. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully your stool is solid, but the testing is not because there's so much we don't know. We don't know what part of the colon that stool was living in. There's different microbiome throughout different parts of your colon. So you shouldn't be diagnosed really with SIBO ever on a stool test. Okay. Root cause of LIBO. Or LIBO, however you want to say it. Large intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Mm -hmm. Same. Dysmotility, dysbiosis. Similar, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have a precise plan on gut healing meal plan slash cleanses? Do you, Della? We do. We do. We absolutely do. We personalize this for our patients. We have an exciting thing coming up soon. Um, we're relaunching our previously very popular plant-based SIBO IBS program, 100% plant-based. Um, and we will have resources for those experiencing all three types of SIBO, hydrogen, methane, hydrogen sulfide, uh, CFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth, um, or just dysbiosis. So, Sign up for a newsletter because you will have the first dibs on getting on the wait list for it. And we do, right now, we do have resources on our website. Mm -hmm. If you go to marytouth.com, those are a little more general, but in the coming months, that's why if you are experiencing IBS SIBO specifically, we'll be getting more specific freebies and meal plans. And then the core, the program and course is going to be very, very comprehensive. Um, next question. So next question it's a great question. Uh, I can't do low FODMAP. And a, a low FODMAP is fermentable, oligo, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. Uh, even though it helps symptoms, it helps symptoms, causes weight loss, but high FODMAP foods cause symptoms. So Wait. this person feels better when they eat low FODMAP, okay. but they lose weight. But oh, maybe cause, they can't okay. afford okay. to lose. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So what do you do? 
So what do you do? Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's important. And one, it's important to understand a low FODMAP diet is not a long-term plan. It is, and this is where it's very, very important to understand uh, the idea of integrative anything, an integrative doctor or dietitian or nurse or whatever it is, is the idea of looking at things in a larger picture, right? So with FODMAPs, uh, you are you are maybe addressing symptoms right now, but are those symptoms it, right? Symptoms are usually surface level communication of your body to your conscious, right? And going like, hey, my knee hurts, something's wrong with my knee, or my skin is getting a rash, or I'm having these, these uh, gut issues. So it's your body speaking to you. If you stop the communication with a medication or a supplement or a quick fix, that doesn't mean you've addressed where those communications were originally coming from, why they even started. So a low FODMAP diet can be helpful, don't get us wrong, but it's not something you do as a, a fix or an actual healing. Um, so yeah, so with that, if you are experiencing weight loss with the low FODMAP diet, then you really need to understand a, probably a little bit more customization, right? Because just to say, hey, I'm going to go on a low FODMAP diet doesn't mean you should eliminate all high FODMAP foods, right? There's many times you can, you can maintain many high FODMAP foods and just tweak or modify certain foods. Something we educate on regularly is understanding each food is unique in and of itself. Each food has its own unique DNA and will interact with your gut in a unique way. So that doesn't mean, okay, I have FODMAPs, uh, mess with me. So all foods that are high FODMAP, I'm just going to completely eliminate. And if you're plant-based or vegan, that can be very, very difficult. And it's no wonder why you will lose weight or have that unintentional weight loss when you don't want it. So I, the short answer to that is customize this. You don't want to just throw everything out that's high FODMAP and also address why a low FODMAP diet feels better to you and, and start there a little bit and dive dive much deeper and while you're that. there in low FODMAP increase your caloric intake of those low FODMAP foods low yeah. FODMAP does not have to mean low calorie so while right. you're in the six weeks of elimination initially in low FODMAP you don't need to be going low calorie so add more of those low fermentable grains, really mm -hmm. grains aside from gluten-free grains, um, you can eat in larger portions, especially something like white rice, which is good calories, um, but not very fermentable. So add in those grains, add in fats as tolerated of some of the low FODMAP nuts and seeds. If you tolerate a little bit of oil and it doesn't slow down your motility, maybe you're adding some cold press flaxseed oil to the top of your food for extra anti-inflammatory effects because it's high in omega-3, as well as extra calories to your diet. Um, so don't sleep on some of those calorie sources because you can definitely get enough calories in if you try mm -hmm. to. Um, and white rice gets a bad rap, but it does have great starch that your microbes yeah. like to feed on. So there, there are benefits to white rice. Obviously, you want to mix it up. I'm not giving you the pass to eat tons of white rice every single day, but you can definitely mix it in and it can be a, a great option. For and sure. if you do, you are running into that and you're like, I just keep losing weight and, and I need to keep going back to low FODMAP, you need to work with somebody at that point. So hopefully yeah. you have a good dietitian on your care team. And if not, you can reach out to our team and we would love to support you. Okay, right. more questions coming in. Do you like Ibergas for motility versus IB Guard? So, Explain what, what is Ibergas and IB Guard? Yeah, Ibergast and IB Guard both contain what's called carminative herbs. Carminative herbs are promotility herbs and promotility compounds that are in them. So, IB Guard, for example, the main active ingredient is peppermint. And we do know so many studies have shown yeah. that peppermint is helpful for lower GI motility. So, it can help with trapped gas. If you do have lower GI trapped gas, like below the belly button, or even in the small intestine, it can also be helpful for constipation. So it can help with motility all around. Um, Iberogast, on the other hand, it does also have peppermint, but it has other things in it, like mm -hmm. angelica root, it has chamomile, it has caraway, it has something called bitter candy fruit, um, lemon balm. So this has a combination of one those promotility carminative herbs. These are some anti-inflammatory herbs 
and their bitters, which can help to stimulate motility through increasing your bile output from your gallbladder. So your gallbladder, mm -hmm. if you have one, um, will squeeze out a little bit more bile when you do consume bitters. So they work very differently. I, I can't say that I'll pick one over the other. It depends on the person and what they're experiencing most. If there's somebody who really just has trapped gas, they don't have much inflammation, um, their gallbladder and liver are working just fine. Maybe that person is using IV guard. I actually prefer Atrantil to IV guard because Atrantil has other anti-inflammatories in it with high dose peppermint. Um, but I have seen people benefit from both Iberogast as well. I've even had some of my patients with colicky babies use a safe dosage of Iberogast and um, that can be helpful for that as well for some of that trapped gas. Another question. Um, what I thought... Uh, what I thought was IBS turned out to be SIBO, according to my tests and gut specialists. Is this common? Yes. Very common. <laughs> and so not all IBS is SIBO, but all SIBO is IBS. Mm -hmm. Rewind that if you need to, but yeah, yes. um, to hear it again. But yes, very, very common. IBS, yeah, not all IBS is SIBO, right? And you might not, you might do a breath test and everything's normal, but you still have chronic gut issues, they would classify that as IBS. We were saying this recently, we say this all the time, IBS is like fibromyalgia. It's like, I have pain all over my body. Okay, you have fibromyalgia. Well, what is it? I don't know, you have fibromyalgia. That's similar to IBS for the gut. You have pain in your gut. Well, what is it? I don't know. We've done an endoscopy, a colonoscopy. We've done some of these, te these basic testing that doctors do and everything looks normal but I don't feel normal. So, so what is that? Right. Um, and there could be, again, a number of reasons for that, but it is very common to then, even, even if this was in the beginning of the year and things continue the way they are and they continue to progress, IBS can turn into SIBO, right. Um, mm -hmm. and it can become SIBO. And uh, there's even instances where you have IBD inflammatory bowel disease, and SIBO. So you, IBS, yeah. so you essentially have IBS and IBD. So I know there's lots mm -hmm. of acronyms here, but for those who, who know this, or maybe this is happening to you, you've been diagnosed with these things, you're going like, oh my gosh, and it can be a lot. So studies do estimate that anywhere from 14 to 70, 70% 70 of IBS is actually SIBO. So that's certainly possible. And like mm -hmm. James was saying, you know, maybe you're that person who had the food poisoning. And at first you just had the discomfort. And slowly as your motility was becoming more affected, your gut slowed down, which then caused dysbiosis because there was so much stagnation. Then you got SIBO. Your IBS can certainly progress into SIBO. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great so question. great question. These are great questions, guys. Yeah. Um, what about just assuming and treating SIBO without testing? Mm. That is a great question. I think a lot of people are kind of yes. doing this. Especially if they're diagnosing via stool test. Yeah. If you're diagnosed via stool test and uh, yeah, many, many things that we're seeing that we would not agree with. Um, I'll start with this. I mean, just the idea of what usually happens is you get on a microbial a, a, a herbal antimicrobial, or you get on um, a antibiotic, right? And so if you, if you don't know if you actually have SIBO, don't get on an antimicrobial and don't get on an antibiotic. Again, this isn't medical advice, but like, you know, if you're not sure, it's, it's just like shooting in the dark, right? It's probably not going to turn out well if you're just shooting blindly. So, yeah. And I would say, it's always best to test if you can work with your care team to ask to get tested. Mm -hmm. Might not always be possible based on where you are regionally or financially. Maybe your insurance isn't covering yeah. it and it's a couple hundred dollars to get tested. But I like for people to get tested because one, it can confirm or deny if you have SIBO. Two, a really well-trained practitioner will know how to read the graphs to maybe say, maybe you actually have CFO, small intestinal mm -hmm. fungal overgrowth or large intestinal fungal overgrowth based on the way your graph looks. And most importantly, if you do have SIBO, you'll know how much SIBO you have because there are cutoffs. So for example, if you have more than 20 parts per million of hydrogen in your breath on your breath test, you're positive for hydrogen SIBO. So 
maybe you have the diarrhea that goes along with it. You have all the symptoms. You either self-treat, hopefully you don't self-treat, um, or your care team suggests something and you feel better for a couple weeks and then it comes back. I've had this happen with patients and, I, and I'm like, okay, you think you should get tested. So they'll get tested and their results come back and their hydrogen is at 120. So one round of treatment is not going to touch that. They need a little bit more involvement than that. So it's not just to know whether you have it. It's to know how much you have when you do have it. Because you might then feel like, well, I already tried that. I'm not going to try that again because I tried it. But you don't know if you gave it enough time or if it was even the appropriate treatment. So if you can get tested, always get tested. Love it. Uh, another comment. I like, I like seeing you guys' Stacey comment. At the Urban Pharmacy. White rice, yay. Uh, very easy on my tummy. One cup rinsed white rice, one cup water, Instapot three minutes Ooh. with natural release. Yeah. Love that. Pressure cooking it. Quick and easy. Who doesn't delicious. have 10 minutes to... You know, and pro tip bonus, I mean, a whole we've done lives on environmental toxins as well. And, and you know, white rice, if you're not sure about it, if you're traveling or if you're with family at a restaurant and you're traveling cross country or wherever you find yourself in, in tricky situations, typically white rice will have less arsenic, less heavy metals or environmental toxins than brown rice. Unfortunately, there is L Lundenberg is a really good brand of brown really good brand of brown rice that is um, that California. they're tested. Mm -hmm. It's California grown. That is a really great brown rice. But if you're out traveling, you don't know you're at some random restaurant. I typically go with white rice. I, I'm just like, I know I, I'll save my brown rice eating when I know the brown rice I'm getting and just do white rice because it still has benefits and you're getting less uh, environmental exposure. Mm -hmm. So um, best supplement for SIBO and candida. A I don't think you can say there's one best yeah. because um, there's different types. There's three different types of SIBO or IMO. So again, hydrogen, methane, hydrogen sulfide, and now you can have fungal overgrowth. So the best place for you to start until you really know what you're dealing with is with nutrition. And one of my favorite things to do is add herbs. So herbs. getting in antimicrobial herbs is always, always, always a great idea, specifically antifungal herbs thyme, cinnamon, oregano, clove, mint, lemongrass, peppermint, eucalyptus. Pretty, pretty much so, all have herbs. a wonderful <laughs> benefit, um, whether you eat them fresh, dry, uh, frozen. I mean, just eat your herbs. I, we posted a reel, I think, on our Instagram. It was like, reminder for the new year, eat herbs. And I literally nice. will sometimes just go in the backyard and do a, a bunch of herbs and just chew them and like making sure I'm getting my fresh herbs. Put them in a smoothie, make a yeah. dressing out of them, get them mm, in. A mint chocolate whole food smoothie. Oh, so good. Delicious. So good. Um, another question is coming in. Uh, there are others. I don't, I want to acknowledge that before moving on because other herbs? there can be other antimicrobials that are helpful, oh, yeah. but again, it, this is for general purposes. So your care team might suggest something specific for you. Um, mm. Antimicrobials can certainly have their place, but you don't want to overdo it either. I think for a long time, people were so focused on kill that they were not yeah. focused on rebuilding and they would actually disseminate large populations of their healthy commensal anti-inflammatory microbes. So also focus on what you can add to feed your good gut bugs. I wanted to say this earlier, and, and you brought that up again, which is, I mean, look at, imagine if someone, which, which is happening, right, is killing huge amounts of the rainforest. Imagine if someone's going to the Great Barrier Reef and just dumping oil, which, which does happen, which does happen. We see those ripple effects throughout the world, right? <laughs> now, imagine that is happening in your gut we will see the ripple effects. Even if it's a tiny portion of your small intestine or large intestine, you might see those ripple effects all the way on your skin in the form of eczema. You might see that as post-nasal drip or severe allergies or migraines. We know that there are connections um, between those things, just like there are connections in the larger environment, right? In terms of slash and burn in the rainforest or polluting our ocean, those have massive ripple effects because the overall understanding or truth is we're all connected, right? There's only so long we can be like, oh, well, that's happening in my colon, whatever. And it's like, well, no, it's, it's going to ripple effect. I mean, definitely you're at risk for 
issues in your colon if it's if things are happening in your colon but they will have ripple effects throughout the entire body so really important to understand that mm -hmm. what's better to help You're both just i'm just rolling because i want to try to answer as many and, I, and we're not going to sound much longer yeah. but um what's better to help bulk stool if i have minor internal hemorrhoid sun fiber or cilium mm. so if you have a mm. minor internal hemorrhoid Sometimes having very bulked stool will actually irritate that because if you have this really round, large stool and you have an internal hemorrhoid, it could stretch stretch the hemorrhoid as you're passing your stool and you could have then bleeding hemorrhoids. Mm -hmm. um, but if you do need to bulk your stool a little bit, I, I would say just based on this, and I don't know more about you because I can't yeah, give personal isn't... medical advice, yeah, but specific. just in general, I would probably go more with sun fiber because it's a little bit more soluble than psyllium. Mm -hmm. So it's going to draw in a little bit more water to hydrate the stool in addition to bulking the stool. Psyllium is one of the most insoluble added fibers. Um, not the most, like inulin is pretty insoluble as well, but psyllium is more insoluble than partially hydrolyzed guar gum, which comes from guar beans. So I would go with PHGG sun fiber. But also make sure you're hydrating mm -hmm. as well, because it can't pull hydration if you're not hydrating. You, there's no hydration at um, what about false positive negatives with SIBO breath test? Mm. Totally. You can have yes. user error. You can mm -hmm. have, uh, again, depending what company you're going with, there's a lot of new companies coming out. They mm -hmm. may not know how to properly package the tests or there may Process. be error when they're processing the test. Totally. The, the secret is there's user error across the board mm -hmm. from the insurance you're getting to see your provider to the test you're taking to understand your body. Mm -hmm. So... For the most part, any good practitioner know, accounts for that user error in their in their plan, I guess Assessment. you could say. Mm -hmm. And that's why it, we, we do say watch out for those practitioners who are like, you took one stool test and we're going to base an entire action plan off just one stool test. And it's going to be this really intense, insane action plan. You know, you treat the person, not the paper. Right. So ask questions and and ask your care team, like, what else are you using to, to give me this action plan? Or what other variables or factors are you taking into account and not just as one test that you did one time? And yeah, so super important to understand that. All right. Is a probiotic okay to take if you're not sure if you have SIBO? Um, so the American College of Gastroenterology does not recommend the use of probiotics when you do have SIBO. You... If you do have bacterial overgrowth or methanogenic overgrowth and you're adding more bacteria with a probiotic supplement, because these probiotics usually are going to market the fact that they have 100 billion colony forming units, 50 billion right. colony forming units of a few strains. Um, so unless you're sure that those are really the strains, which it's difficult to know if those are the strains that you actually need. I wouldn't start with a SIBO probiotic unless your care team has recommended it for you. Maybe they have identified, hey, you don't eat any dairy. You don't eat any lacto-fermented vegetables. You have low motility in your colon. You took tons of antimicrobials. Maybe you don't have enough lactobacillus. So they're replenishing that. Or maybe you don't have sufficient bifidobacteria. You have low short-chain fatty acids work with your care team on that. But I would say in general, if you do have, if you're not sure if you have SIBO, start with probiotic foods and try to get that bacteria in there. So even if you do need that lactobacillus bifidobacteria, whatever it is, replenished, try with probiotic foods. Um, one of the probably safer blends of added microbe is maybe Saccharomyces boulardii. It's actually a friendly type of yeast that can help out crowd out other types of yeast. So sometimes, you know, that could be one that's safer and less risky, but if you suspect you have SIBO, I wouldn't be playing around with probiotics unless otherwise indicated. Mm -hmm. I think Ooh, we, we did. are. All right. I mean, minutes. I'm sure I think we've seen more talking. questions come in, but I think this is... <laughs> Uh, this Someone's is a saying good Lundberg part. organic jasmine white rice is the best. Um, so yeah, yeah, it, that's it. a good one. And Shout someone out. said, I was told by an RD to take restore flora. Okay. So hmm. if they're, they know your health history, um, you can consider their advice. So it seems like they made that recommendation based on knowing you. 
Yeah. And this is, we do these lives and we love answering these questions. And we always, always remind you all, this is not personal medical advice. If you do want personal tailored medical nutrition therapy, you can always go on our website and sign up to work with one of our incredible RDs. Yeah. We have quite the diverse team. Some of us specialize in IBS and SIBO. We do have a dietitian who's plant-based integrative specializing in cancer. We have another plant-based integrative dietitian who works with those with metabolic conditions like um, body composition management, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. We have one of our RDs who's trained in neo-emotional release. So if trauma has been a part of mm. your gut health story, Laura is incredible with that. We're bringing on a pediatric dietitian and who's plant-based and integrative. So more amazing RDs to come to be added to our team. So if you need that personal support for you and your fam, you can head over to marytelf.com and check us out or just some of our free resources, our blog, social media posts. So turn on notifications, guys, subscribe, sign up for our newsletter, connect with us. We, we so appreciate all the support and your love and this community. And we're excited. Uh, stay tuned for next coming up would be our dietitian talk where you get to talk with our dietitians yes. and we'll do another Q&A on a cool topic. And so stay tuned, subscribe. If you want to sign up for being on our wait list for our SIBO IBS program, subscribe. Subscribe to our newsletter, marytalk.com. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody. This was great. We love seeing all your questions. You guys Thank had you amazing questions. questions and comments. We all love this. And uh, we're so excited to be here. And our Good Gut members had amazing questions. And our Good Gut members, just if you're curious, they're usually patients. And through our practice, they can sign up to become Good Gut members through our patient portal. So everybody have a wonderful weekend. Friday. We hope you're going to connect. We hope you're going to breathe your mm -hmm. biome out in the environment, eat some pre postbiotics and make those postbiotics and eat those prebiotics and fiber. Go in your garden, do all these great things. I know we're going to be doing Unless that. you're tired and you just want to rest. <laughs> or just, or just nap. <laughs> or just nap. That's fine too. Thank um, you all. All right, everybody. We'll see you all next time. We hope you heal with, heal each, with meal. each meal, everybody. Bye.